This video is sponsored by Brilliant. All right, here's the puzzle. We need to prove that given any configuration of 10 points on a flat plane, it is always possible to cover every point with at most 10 equally sized non-overlapping coins. And yes, we are assuming these are infinitely small zero dimensional points. I always get comments about this, so I'm emphasizing here, these are infinitely small. I can't show that because, well, you'd see nothing. But just realize all we care about is covering the very center of these dots you see here. Also, we're fixing the size of these coins. The original question, I think, involved unit circles instead of coins, but it doesn't matter. We fix the size of the coins and then must show for any configuration of 10 points that at most 10 coins are needed to cover them all. Some configurations may require fewer, but we have to prove it's always possible with at most 10 non-overlapping coins. Alright, now before getting into it, let me just say, this is not obvious. Both the proof and just the fact that you can always do this covering. In fact, if we were to ask a different question, can you always cover n points with at most n equally sized non-overlapping coins, the answer is now no. Like, this configuration of 45 points is an example of a configuration that cannot be covered with 45 coins, or really unit circles in this case. These outer points are a distance of 1.0001 from the origin. So the size of the coins we're using would be this. And now you might be able to see how once you start placing coins, you quickly run into trouble. I could place one here and here, and already it's impossible to cover this point without that overlap. So again, we're going to prove it's always possible when n is 10. We see here it's not always possible when n is 45. And from what I saw in this paper, it seems like we actually still don't know where this breaks, the first integer at which it's not always possible to cover n points with n coins. But we do know it's somewhere between 13 and 45 inclusive. Okay, now for those who want to try this on their own with no hints, pause here. For everyone else, to get started, the first thing we need to realize is that the tightest packing of coins on a plane, assuming no overlap, looks like this where you get this hexagonal lattice, and this has a packing density of pi root 3 over 6, or this here. This means when you arrange equally sized coins like this, that about 90.7% of the table is covered, and about 9.3% is open. So here's where I want to be careful, because while this proof isn't long, it might not be satisfying unless explained right. If we had one point on our plane and randomly just tossed this lattice onto that plane, it shouldn't be hard to see there's a 90.7% chance that that point will be covered. If we kept just randomly tossing that lattice onto the plane, most of the time the point will be covered, but occasionally, about 9.3% of the time, it won't be. Another way to think about this is the expected number of points that will be covered by randomly placing this lattice is 0.907. Obviously, you can't cover a fraction of a point. In this situation, either one point or zero points will be covered each time. But if we kept doing this, tossing our lattice onto the plane, and looked at the number of points covered each time, which will be one or zero, and kept track of that running average of all tosses up to that point, like right here, the average number of points covered after four tosses is 0.75, over time, that average would approach 0.907. That's what we mean by the expected number of points covered is 0.907, and that comes from the packing density being 90.7%. Now, with 10 points, we just multiply this all by 10. Each point has a 90.7% chance of being covered, so the expected number of points that will be covered by our lattice is 9.07. Meaning, if we toss this lattice randomly onto the plane over and over, it will cover some integer number of points between 0 and 10. But over time, that average will approach 9.07. So, since the average of these numbers approaches 9.07, and these numbers can only assume integer values between 0 and 10 inclusive, the number of points covered, then at least one of these must be 10. Right? If they were all 0 to 9, then the average couldn't be 9.07. So we know at least one must be 10, meaning some toss or covering of this lattice, like we see here, 
must cover all 10 points. But that means at most 10 coins in that lattice were used to actually cover the points. The rest were unnecessary since no point can be covered by more than one coin. And this mostly completes the proof. We found there always exists some covering with at most 10 equally sized non-overlapping coins. And what's cool is we did it using probability and expected values. But I have overlooked one thing which really explains why this works, and that is the linearity of expectation. When you roll a single fair die, the expected value is 3.5. We can't roll a 3.5, but if you roll the die over and over and average those results over time, that value would approach 3.5. But the thing is, expectation is linear. If you wanted to find the expected value of the sum of two dice, could you just say, oh, well, it's the expected value of each one added up, 3.5 plus 3.5? Well, the answer is yes. In fact, you can do this regardless of whether the events are independent or not. The expected value of the two dice is 7. Roll the two over and over and average the sums, and that will converge to 7. That's why we were able to go from that one point scenario, having an expected covering of 0 0.907, to 10 points having an expected covering of 9.07. We were allowed to just multiply by 10 because of that linearity, and that's why this proof works. And you can find more on exactly why expectation is linear, as well as more probability puzzles over at Brilliant, the sponsor of this video. If you like what you saw here, one course they have that you will definitely enjoy is Perplexing Probability, which goes through various counterintuitive probability games, puzzles, and experiments. Here you'll see some of the surprising results that come from things like a change in conditions, such as with the Monty Hall problem, or the lesser known but very controversial boy or girl paradox. What's great about this course is that it not only teaches you the technical mathematics behind these puzzles, but also shows you how to think about these in a more intuitive way, which reveals why the counterintuitive solution is in fact the correct one. And this can be challenging to do at first. Like with the Monty Hall problem, one great way to see why switching doors makes a difference is to simply change the problem to one with a lot more doors, and then it becomes more apparent why it is in your benefit to switch. So as you can see with Brilliant, it's not just looking at equations and coming to a solution, but learning how to actually think about these more challenging problems and puzzles, which is really the best way to learn not just mathematics, but also science and engineering. And Brilliant has courses covering a wide range of all of these topics. Then the first 200 people to click the link below or go to brilliant.org slash Zachstar will get 20% off their annual premium subscription. And with that, gonna end that video there. Thanks as always to my supporters on Patreon, social media links to follow me are down below, and I'll see you all in the next video.